I'm Athena Chu of Soul Speakers Bureau, and today we have a seasoned artist, key figure in Pixar's Renderman's group's identity, and the designer of the Renderman walking teapot, Dylan Sisson. Hello Dylan, as an animation graduate myself, it's very great to meet you. Good to meet you. <laughs> Could you give us a brief introduction about yourself? Yeah, my name is Dylan Sisson. I joined Pixar Animation Studios in 1999. Okay. So since then, I've been working in the Random Man Group. Before that, I was working in comic books, mm -hmm. 2D animation, and 3D animation. I worked at a, on a couple games, mm -hmm. and uh, also did a commercial for Wolf Vinton Studios. That's, that's how I kind of got over to Pixar, and uh, since then, I've been in the Random Man Group where we've been working on uh, our core rendering technology. Renderman is such a powerful tool right now, and not only the animated animation industry, but also the film industry as a whole. Many movies such as Elemental and Jurassic Park, just to name a few, have used Renderman to bring difficult effects to life on the screen, uh, like realistic lighting sources and fire physics. How does the R&D team continue to push the limits of the current uh, technology, and how do things like machine learning AI and generative AI affect the way the program is being used or maybe will be used? I think that's a, a great question because it really gets to the core of like uh, uh, the heart of Pixar is really taking technology and art and bringing them together to tell stories. <sighs> and so in the beginning, when Rider Man started back in 1988, um, it was architected to use the hardware of the time to as, do as much as it could. Mm -hmm. And we were able to start doing digital visual effects. At the time, we would do a lot of things like cheating light. So we made it, we would simulate light, but with today's software and today's compute, we can actually emulate what light is doing. So we don't have to cheat anymore. Uh -huh. And this requires more compute power and it allows us to also use new technologies like machine learning for denoising, machine learning for upscaling, and um, sophisticated forms of light transport that can simulate things like light bouncing off a colored wall onto a, a floor and capturing some of that color. So we, we're fortunate today to be able to really put whatever vision a director has onto the screen with the technology, yeah. And also right in front of us, we have the Renderman walking teapot that you designed. And very iconic, while the Utah teapot was from 1973 by Martin Newell, and it was used to showcase how different rendering techniques can be seen on the unique shape of the teapot. How does adding legs affect its usage? And how did you get this idea for it to be the mascot of the Renderman group? The Utah teapot, when Martin Newell designed it in 1973, was one of the only models that was really available for computer graphics research. Oh, yes. um, and like you said, because it has concave surfaces and convex surfaces, it was really good for showcasing different types of surface shaders. Mm, yes when I was getting started in computer graphics, every computer program had a little Easter egg where you could make the Utah teapot with a click of a button. Oh. And in RenderMan, we had a geometric primitive called the RI teapot, mm -hmm. which you could just call like a sphere or a dot. Oh. So uh, the teapot was something that everyone in the computer graphics industry knew about, but nobody else did. So I thought, well, I was supposed to make a brochure for RenderMan, and I thought, well, wouldn't it be cooler if I made a toy? So I thought, well, maybe I use the Utah teapot, and then I thought maybe I can get wind-up legs. And I emailed about 100 toy companies around the world, and one replied to me, and uh, we started making the teapots. And it, it, it was funny because at first, people didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. So we'd hand it out, People would be like, can we have a brochure? We'd give them a teapot, they'd be like, what's that? And after two years, people started lining up for it and that became a kind of a, its own sensation. Yeah, so not only is it really cute, but it also helps promote it outside of the animation industry. Yeah, and I think it's the, the teapot is something that we display at SIGGRAPH now in a museum. Mm -hmm. So we have a museum of all the different teapots and it's kind of cool because you can go there at any time during 
the conference and there's people there taking photos of the teapots <laughs> and I'll go stand at the um, museum and people will be like, yeah, I started in computer graphics and this one was my first teapot. I still have it on my desk. So people, it's a memento that means something to people, which is kind of nice to see. So it started off as kind of a lighthearted joke, but people seem to like them, so we keep making them. Oh, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, also next to the teapots, we also have this cute little creature. Do you want to talk about that a little bit as well? Yeah, I think one of the interesting things I get to do in my role mm -hmm. in Render Man is I get to test the new rendering software. Uh, so whenever we add a new feature to Render Man, I get to play around with that. And I, I've found that I can also incorporate new technologies when I'm, you know, trying to get something to render with Render Man. Mm -hmm. I started doing VR sculpting. Oh. So I began doing VR sculpting and realized that it had a lot of interesting things that it brought to the table uh, because if you model something inside of Maya, mm -hmm. a lot of times it looks like it was modeled in a computer. Yes. If I VR sculpt something, it looks like it wasn't modeled on a computer that mm -hmm. was handmade. Yeah. So that's an example of something that I created as a VR sculpt, mm -hmm. rendered in RenderMan, and then I decided, well, I'll make some prints and, and um, bottle openers out of it. So that's a steel cast of a of a VR sculpt, but it doesn't seem like it was made in a computer. Oh no. But I did find the center of gravity so it like stands up straight and <laughs> it just, um, I was able to model the whole thing inside a computer. Yeah. yeah. It's really cool how it's kind of like the merging of technology and like model clay making, you know, just to give that handmade quality. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, everybody's familiar with some of the films that that Pixar's made, you know, from Toy Story to like Elemental and Inside Out 2, but Render Man's used throughout the film industry. Yes. So even if you look at a studio like Leica, mm -hmm. who does stop motion animation, they use Render Man a lot for secondary puppets, for set extensions. And so a lot of the work that they do is looking at their stop motion characters mm -hmm. and saying, we need to create this exact same thing in 3D. So they're always trying to solve this problem of how can we make it look like it's a handmade stop motion puppet, a handmade stop motion set. Uh -huh. And they do that very, very well. Yes. But um, the software is capable of doing that today mm -hmm. in, in ways that it wasn't even six years ago. Uh, last but not least, without stepping on any toes, what's next for Pixar's Renderman? Is there a current challenge or barrier you and the team are trying to best for the next project? Is there a project that may combine your work with your creative pursuits in the future, perhaps? Yeah, I think at, at Pixar, we have two cornerstones of technology. And one is, one is Renderman mm -hmm. and one is USD. You may have, may have heard USD. Mm -hmm. which stands for Universal Scene Description. Oh. And it's, uh, we've open sourced that, and it's used throughout the film industry, but also the product industry. And uh, it's, it's a great format because it allows people to work collaboratively on 3D data. And then RenderMan is engineered to consume the complexity of data that USD can be used to create. Oh, I see. So one of the challenges from, from a standpoint of directing a film or directing a visual story is creating a, an amount of data that the director can come in and edit mm -hmm. individual things. And so with, with RenderMan, we've been putting a lot of work into the feature of interactivity. Mm -hmm. So, uh, a lighting lead or an art director or the director can come into uh, a lighter's office or a shader's office and make notes right away or say, hey, maybe you should make this blue or change the color of this and we can do that interactively. If we provide our artists with the tools to do things quicker, mm -hmm. they can arrive at creative de decisions faster. So that's one of the big things that we're looking at to enhance um, the creative flow mm -hmm. and also the efficiency of, of the studio. So just that artist experience is something that we're really focused on. 
Um, other elements are in the realm of implementing new features that allow us to render things like volumes better and to mm -hmm. create more accurate uh, simulations of light in kind of fire explosions, volumes, and get more sophisticated results uh, uh, that way. And then we have another category, which would be not rendering things photorealistically, but mm -hmm. stylized. So mm -hmm. maybe rendering things that look like they're hand drawn or look like they have a more painterly approach. Mm -hmm. So if we look at Luca, in Elemental, we're kind of pushing the looks in different directions, and we want to be able to push those looks even further. So it's a, I think it's an exciting time for, for us in the Render Man group because we're, we're getting to deliver new types of tools uh, for, for the artists in production at Pixar and then uh, at ILM and across the industry too. Thank you so much for joining us here in South Korea. Um, it was really great meeting you, and I'm sure everyone is looking forward to the next Pixar project and to see where your creative pursuits might go in the future as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much.